9-11, Big 550 KTRS. Many times you talk about the uh, stories of the day. Many times I get into conversations with people where I say, you know, that story's not being covered enough. And sometimes I'm lucky enough for them to say, hey, I got a guy you need to talk to to talk about that story if you think it's of value. And that's exactly what happened with our next guest. I was talking with a legendary PR person here in town, John Boykman, and I started up a, a conversation and Somehow we got in the conversation of the sex trade, and I said, boy, that's a story that is not being told. And she said, I got a guy. Turns out she's got a guy. Joining us now is Michael Henderson. Michael, you are a St. Louisan, and you uh, own and CEO and is founder of a company called Phoenix Risk Management. Thanks for joining us here on the Big 550 KTRS. Thank you for having me. If you can talk right in the microphone, you cannot talk too close. Good. Uh, Born and raised here in St. Louis? That's correct. Phoenix is a risk assessment company based here in St. Louis, but you work... Worldwide. Worldwide. That's correct. For example, what what, what does your company do? So basically, uh, we protect corporate executives, high net worth families, either on vacation or for business, uh, as well as authors, what have you. We protect them domestically, internationally, and mainly in the most hostile and violent parts of the earth. So you'll go to Israel. You'll go, to, go to Afghanistan. Uh, you'll go absolutely wherever. South Africa, what have you. Uh, you're also going, what are you doing this weekend? Uh, we are doing some work uh, for the Oscars. So you're providing some security, individual security for That's correct. some some uh, movie stars. Okay. Um, the company's based here. That's correct. How long has it been in, in business? Uh, we've been in St. Louis uh, for about three and a half years. I've been in the industry for about 17, going on 18. You are the CEO of the company. How many employees do you have? We have about 17. 17. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about you for a second. Uh, where were you born and ra- You were born and raised here in St. Louis. But you had an interesting start to your life, did you not? Yeah, absolutely. I actually started out as a 15-year-old runaway uh, and then uh, became homeless a couple of times uh, before and after my law enforcement career. And uh, what's interesting about that is there weren't any drugs or alcohol involved in that. It was just purely trying to start a business, and there wasn't uh, a lot of help for that. So you you ran away when you were 15 years old to, to start a business? No, I ran away from uh, when I was 15 years old. 15 years old because uh, I was I thought I knew the world and okay. I thought I knew everything where'd you go to high school University City High okay so 15 years old you were homeless on the streets of St. Louis that's correct where did you where did you stay where did you I mean was it under a bridge literally yeah I would uh, from time to time I would stay with my friends families uh, and sometimes I would live on the streets uh, I would always uh, go to school that was kind of a shelter throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're familiar with University City, there's sure. a gas station, Sinclair Gas Station, at Hanley and Delmore, and I used to take a shower in the bathroom there. Uh, what what years are we talking about here? 1985. So you would shower in the bathroom of the garage. Which meant the sink. <laughs> and, and then you would go to school. That's correct. So what was it? You thought school was your only way out? Were you, tell me about uh, your family life. Was it so bad you had to get out, or was it you just sort of thought you knew it all at the time? I totally thought I knew it all. Now, the family situation wasn't as bad. I mean, I lived with a single mother right. uh, who definitely was doing her part and her best. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, but very easily you could have fallen into the wrong hands. You could have, right? I, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, being a homeless teenager in St. Louis in the 80s, um, that's an education in and of itself, I s- suspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, why did you not get into drugs? Why did you not get into alcohol? And did you run across any person who wanted to take advantage of you? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I look at it, and when I look back, I look, I look back and I say how fortunate I am. Of course, I came across uh, those individuals that are definitely heavy in the drug scene because uh, they live in the street life and, right. and nighttime. Uh, but yet my friends that I did stay with, uh, they had very caring uh, parents and uh, non-judgmental, And so that helped me significantly. And then the only thing I really knew at that time was school. Right. So, and that was free. Yeah. So, But somebody in your life said, Michael Henderson, no matter what happens, your only way out is through school. That's correct. Yeah. And that That's sort correct. of stayed with you. Absolutely. Because I don't think you're born with that. Absolutely not. Right. Somebody's got to instill that in you. And Absolutely. As, and as bad as it might have been, it's pre- I mean, it's it's a testament to shower in the sink and to splash water on your face to, to go to high school. Yeah. You know, and what's interesting about that quickly is, you know, life repeats itself. Uh, when I left law enforcement and I went overseas for training to be in executive protection, which is the industry I'm in now, uh, I came back and tried to start my business here in St. Louis, and that wound me 
uh, again, living on the streets again, uh, house hopping at first, and just trying to find capital uh, to start the business. And I lived under Highway 40 at 20th Street exit for about four months. When was this? Uh, this was in 1997. And I would sneak into the RCGA uh, after hours business networking events because it was it was five dollars, right? And there was food there, and I would still try to. So, so you would you would market. You would live under Highway Forty, huh? and at night you would then sneak into the RCGA Resource Center. <laughs> That's exactly right. Sorry, RCGA. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a member of the RCGA now? I am not. I, well, I once was. All, I once was. First of all, shame on them. They should be promoting you. Uh, all, 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 all over the place. I'll for that. I think I'm, they're probably going to give me a bill shortly. And so, for for, for so you would, ha, when you say you lived under a bridge, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, you know, it, it's really interesting because at the same time, uh, I sat on a couple of charity boards, which is really and has been my footprint for St. Louis, uh, being philanthropic. Um, so I would definitely do that. But I spent a lot of time uh, at the downtown library. Uh, which b back then, and I don't know where, where the library, business library is uh, now, located after the renovation, but it was in the basement. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time reading um, books on stock and, and business and biographies of businessmen. And then uh, across the street, they have uh, Christ Church Cathedral. And I would spend a lot of time inside there. And, and that's where I got a lot of motivation right. from the from the priest inside there. Uh, um, it's a pretty extraordinary story. So every dime went into your business that's correct including your mortgage and or rent when i had one yeah yeah um so you started the company yeah i mean i would house hop of course and, and like most people uh, and no fault of theirs um you know you always hear the go get a job so you try to go get a job and then uh you know this opportunity comes about and it either it could be the one right and uh, unfortunately from in my case back then it wasn't did you did you use uh st, st. patrick center at, at all did you use some of the homeless resources out there i i did not normally uh the only one that i really uh made a connection with was christ church cathedral right uh which now i i have been uh, a, a member but also a volunteer for the yeah. breakfast club I never really took advantage of the services, uh, per se. Um, it's just been a very fortunate drive. But you were homeless. More normally, most homeless people are addicted to drugs or alcohol, have an issue. Seems like you were homeless for a different reason. Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean, that was never my issue. And, and I, and I tongue-in-cheek it now, years later, uh, to say that, wow, there's no support group for an a entrepreneur out there. You know, and I always sometimes say if I had had that problem, I probably would have had help faster. Yeah. Um, so when you hear people who say they can't start a business because of whatever reason, you s just sort of laugh at them? No, I don't laugh. I, I mean, I, I definitely can resonate with them, but I definitely motivate them. Right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the reason why you're actually on the show is because um, I started talking about sex trafficking and how it's an underreported story in the news media. And you've, you're on the front lines of security. Uh, let me. And when I was getting ready for the show, somebody said, oh, you're talking about sex, sex crimes. And I said, yeah. And I said, here in St. Louis. And they said, well, it's not here in St. Louis. And I said, yes, it is. From the front lines, Michael Henderson from Phoenix Risk Management. Is sex trafficking going on here in St. Louis? Absolutely. It's very complex. Um, you're going to stick around and you're going to tell us all about it, okay? Yes, sir. 920 here on the Big 550 KTRF. All right, Michael Henderson is with us. He is the CEO and founder of a risk management company called Phoenix Risk Management based here in St. Louis. He works all over the world. We actually uh, invited you, Michael Henderson, to talk about uh, sex trafficking here in St. Louis because so many people do not realize how big of an issue it is and that, yes, it does reach uh, into St. Louis. How? Explain to us... When we say the sex trade, what what does that mean exactly? What what are we talking about when we talk about the the sex trade? Yeah, well, you know, we're really referring and, and speaking to sex trafficking and human trafficking, and how it affects our minors. And it's not uh, an urban environment issue. It's actually a cross cultural and economic issue, um, where our children are being kidnapped. And it's not normally what you would always think of of being kidnapped, like in the movies, but also being. Uh, basically being taken by, oddly enough, their friends, family of their friends, uh, being lured into, um, it's better to live with us, it's better to stay here, uh, and then all of a sudden be manipulated into working in child pornogra pornography, forced labor, 
uh, prostitution. We how, how big of a problem is it, and 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 how many times do these girls and boys get caught up into this in St. Louis? I mean, is, are are there any numbers out there? You know, the numbers are hard hard to really estimate, and because to your point, uh, it's, we've learned last year that there are fifty percent of the victims of sex trafficking are male. And so most of the time, most people would think that it's majority women. Uh, But beyond that, the numbers and the data are somewhat confusing and complex uh, as people are evolving in their education. We hear that the Super Bowl was in New Jersey. And so we hear that sort of weird story that they're worried that the prostitutes are going to come to New New Jersey and there's going to be a higher sex trafficking because of that. Is that is that accurate? That's exactly accurate. Uh, there were a multitude of arrests two weeks before and during the Super Bowl, and that's really the modus operandi. You know, your child could be taken from St. Louis and then work throughout the country and sometimes internationally. How come we don't, when, when a little kid is taken, there's an Amber Alert? Mm-hmm. When a 16-year-old girl is missing, how come we don't hear about that? That's exactly right, and I think that's one of the things that social services and law enforcement are really trying to do when it comes to bills and legislation, which is why they're really trying to educate your listeners and why I'm here today to educate your listeners to push, to promote their senators and congressmen to find the funding so that we can crack the vicious cycle. How come we don't hear of men who, the Johns, if you will, in this situation, how come we don't hear about them being caught? Yeah, and that's one of the nice things about the education and the media presence on this is that they are starting to get caught and incarceration is starting to happen uh, and sadly uh, the last two years ago um, we had a multitude of cases in st louis in kirkwood missouri a family in st peter's that was actually using the friends of their child their children and selling them off uh, for sex so it's happening and there are arrests that are being made is it uh craigslist is it the internet is it word of mouth how how does it get out it's all of the above it's it's not just the there's a pimp uh, type of mentality again a lot of women are predators uh, because they have that motherly nurturing sense to make a child feel comfortable you have uh, sex victims sex trafficking victims who started out at infancy or nine years old that have now turned into young adults who have apartments that are still in the trade and they're used to lure our younger kids into the into the business has it always been like this and we just uh, know about it more has the sex trade always been around or has it sort of grown over the last number of years that's a great question you know traveling internationally for example we have a lot of clients uh, whose children go and study abroad and while they're there we can't always have a physical presence so our company we have we offer uh, client interactive tracking for example and basically it's a device that an app that's put on your phone that you can have an emergency alert button. It has 20 seconds of audio, and that allows us to monitor if we need to and get assistance to our clients' children when they're abroad or domestically. The trade has grown so much. Internationally, you have that problem in places that you wouldn't think. France, the UK, and now it's just all over. We're not talking- The United States. uh, uh, Michael Henderson is with us, who is a security expert. We're not talking about the runaway girl who is has parents have left them abandoned them those girls are also um uh who you expect but we're also talking about middle class girls upper middle class girls and boys and boys that's correct and they get upset with mom because mom makes them turn off the facebook so they leave and they're out on the street and they get picked up and they're off and running that's correct where does the drugs come into all this a lot of places sometimes that's part of the manipulation process in getting them to take control and so one of the things in time and I know we don't have a lot of time today but you know there are identifiers that your listeners can 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 rec- um, that can see so that they can try to identify well maybe my son or my daughter's in something they shouldn't be right what are some of those uh, things you know some of those are distant communication aggressive behavior uh, when you actually like your, your example before when you're talking about turning off the internet or monitoring their their internet social media uh, content but then it goes into um, a fear behavior pattern um, poor hygiene rotten teeth over a period of time once they are gone um, there's just so many 
Right. Uh, the, we, we keep hearing about the meth epidemic, and we keep hearing about the heroin epidemic. Mm-hmm. Is that tied into this sex trade? Oh, without question. Keep in mind that when you deal with narcotics and you deal with families that, are, that have that problem, using children to feed that habit, it's, it's a no-brainer. It goes hand in hand. It's a marriage without question. Uh, are there hotels right now in St. Louis that are being rented out by sex traffickers and using St. Louis girls and boys for sex? I can't really speak to that, but I will say on the flip side of that, there are hotels that are now being aware and educated to identify possible sex trafficking uh, tr- sex trafficking victims. So the so the, the reach out is getting to the uh, to the hospitals so they can say wait a minute this girl this doesn't look right. Yeah, this doesn't look like just a normal sexual assault or juvenile delinquent. Right. I mean, my my, more my gut's this. telling me that this girl should not be with this guy. That's exactly right. Or this kid shouldn't be with that girl or whatever That's else. That's exactly right. So when you say guys, you, you mean that there are men out there who prey upon little boys. That's correct. Uh, are there women who prey on boys, too? That's exactly correct. Come on. No, that's exactly correct. There are women out there who traffic in young boys who have been manipulated. Oh, that's a, exactly. It, it's, it's such a huge phenomenon, an epidemic, that no one is really safe. And you have to, and for it to end, uh, you have to be educated. And you have to know, and that's one of the things that the FBI, I think, is doing a great job in leading this. And they're educating law enforcement to no longer think it's the sexual predator across the street. Not to say that it's not, right? but to also be cognizant enough to understand that there are many other variables involved. Um, somebody told me this, and I'm going to ask you point blank. I, I cannot believe what I'm about to ask you. Um, when the kidnapped boy or the brainwashed man or girl, uh, are, when they're finished with them, what happens to them? Oh, there are a multitude of options. Uh, if they're not rescued by a law enforcement agency or a social service agency, uh, we've heard of stories and have seen uh, bodies being transferred internationally uh, where their organs are used. So they sell, they sell their organs. Yeah, that's human trafficking at its best. <laughs> so when they're finished with the, with the kidnapped boy or the kidnapped girl, they sell their organs. They could possibly. On the black market. They could possibly. That is a serious and realistic option. Um, it is so sad. We don't know numbers. Do you know numbers worldwide, how many kids are being trafficked? Yeah, they're different. Uh, the United Kingdom, they have about 800,000 at any time. Uh, in the United States, the numbers are just so hard to obtain because we're still making that education uh, paradigm shift, if you will, right. in the mentality of thinking, wait a minute, it's boys as well. It's not just girls. It's not just infants. It's males. And yeah. so that kind of confuses the numbers. Um, some pretty scary stuff. Michael Henderson is with us. He's with a St. Louis company called Phoenix Risk Management, and he's here talking about a story that does not get a lot of attention, but he's shedding some light on it. Michael Henderson, we'll come back. Maybe a phone call or two, 314-968-969-KTRS, uh, 1-888-550-KTRS or star KTRS. Uh, would you take a couple, couple phone calls or two? Oh, absolutely. All right, we'll do that uh, in a second. 935 here, Big 550 KTRS.